you know, all winter long, we think about the upcoming spring season as farmers. And it's everything from what seed to buy, how do we set our planter up, what day do we start, what's tillage look like, and all the different things that come into play. As we walk in a field though, that's where the high reward starts to come. In this case, we're in a soybean field. It was vertical tilled. In other words, they're a fast rolling hair only working an inch deep. We worked this bean ground. Then we had a planter come through here at 35,000. In this case, we're in narrow row corn, 20 inch corn. So we should be finding a plant coming through every nine inches. And so as we take a look at the ground where we're at here, we just start to analyze it. And I'm excited because I really like what I see. And so at every nine inches, we should have a plant just coming through. Agronomists tell us that the more even the emergence, the higher the yield. And so this field is set up to hit a home run. So I have a plan here, one, two, three, four. I don't see one right here. We have six here, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So we have 10 perfectly spaced plants with number five, hopefully just under the surface. So we'll take our jackknife here and just work this area a little bit. We'll probably break him off, but let's take a look and see. And our hope is that the planter didn't skip. We realize the cost to a skip. And here he is. He's right here under the surface. And so as we look at him here, we can see right here where he's at. So in this particular case, as we can see here, this guy is just an hour or two behind. He's soon to emerge. The exercise, you need to dig enough of these gaps early on in this stage to see do we have a planter that's either skipping or creating doubles, or even that we have residue in the trench that created some kind of seedling blights. These are things that we tuck away to always improve ourselves for the following season. And so it's not only just about the planter, it's about residue management. It could be even how did our starter attachments respond? If this had been a high amount of starter on the seed, did we burn a section of this new row and we have some seed missing that way? It's always a learning moment. So as we're out analyzing our crop and thinking at different stages of growth, today we're in a field here at V4. And so this crop right at this stage is just coming into the critical part of where it selects how many rows around it's going to be. And so there's lots of things that we can check in a V4 field. For example, this field is yet to be sprayed post and we can see some weed pressure here. And so it's just a matter of time as soon as it dries up in here, we'll be in with the Hagee sprayer and we'll be working over the top with a broadleaf chemical. As we look at our stands, and we can see there's lots of things that we check. This is a great time to check, what about planting depth, sidewall compaction? What are things we can learn for next year that we can take another step ahead? So let's just go ahead and dig a plant up here. We'll pop him out. And we'll take a look at the seeding depth. When it comes to seeding depth, it becomes pretty easy to know exactly where that planter ran. The reason I like raising corn so much, there's never any secrets. We can always tell how deep the planter ran. In this case, the plant I just dug up, you can see the remaining seed, and you can see the mesocotyl between here and the actual corn plant in the crown. When you measure this, you always add three quarters of an inch, and that's planting depth. So in this case, we have a three quarter inch mesocotyl, and we add three quarters, this particular plant was set at an inch and a half. This planter was set at an inch and five eighths, so just the way he landed, he's about an eighth inch different than what we would say we were desired for perfect. At the same time, how do we know that the depth worked well? Because every plant that's in here is the exact same size, and it's a great recipe for success. As we look at this particular plant, we realize that very soon, it's going to hand the baton from this seed where the starch is. So the mama seed is feeding this plant up to about this day. Then it's going to hand the baton off to the new crown roots. Each plant puts on five sets of crown roots. The first and second crown root are very critical. 
If you and I would have done tillage in here, and we just set in a horizontal tillage layer at say four and a half inches, and as these root systems grow down and they hit that tillage change or density change, not say compaction, just density change, we're gonna create an environment where the root's gonna turn. This plant has the ability to understand when roots turn, it's under stress. Later in the season, we will know, because we can pull back an ear and pull the shuck back, and an inch up from the butt of the ear, we will see where it's scrambled. So let's say that ear had potential for 18 rows around, an inch up from the butt, it scrambled and lost two rows and went to 16. We call this a hidden loss. Every row around on an ear of corn is worth 10 bushel to you. If this plant, due to tillage, and it reached a layer where it communicated to the plant that it's under stress, and it knocked off two rows, that's a 20 bushel hit. So as growers, this is the time we analyze all that. And we can come in with a jackknife, and we can start to work this seed trench. And we can go down to seeding depth and tillage depth and we say, can we pick up a density change? And so at V6, the V4 to V6, like this field is soon to be a V6, this is a time when we can learn a lot about each of our individual farming operations. So I just stepped across the path from the previous field we were just in, which was corn on soybeans, into a corn on corn field. This field was planted about four days earlier, and it's in V5. And I look at a corn on corn field differently than I do corn and soybeans. The main concern I have here at this stage is what is a carbon penalty? So right out of the gate in our operation, we're gonna put at least 30 more units of anon pre-plant than we would onto a soybean field going into corn. So in this case, we have 125 units on at V5. V5 because I see one, two, three, four, and five, and this one is still in the whirl and vertical, but this corn is soon to be V6. As we talk about the carbon penalty, it comes from the residue. So the microbials in this field are breaking down all the nitrogen that's been applied. This particular planter has nitrogen two by two by two. In other words, we're applying nitrogen on each side of the row of 30 units and we're putting about five gallon of starter on the seed with the Keaton seed firmer. This puts us in a perfect position to have a great uptake of nitrogen, never putting this plant under stress, making sure we have left enough nitrogen for the microbials to feed on the residue and break it down, but that we never run this plant out of in. So starter on the seed to keep it a good quick response due to these cold temperatures we had this spring with a good band of nitrogen on each side for these root system to feed on. Won't be long, we'll be in here for soil scan, we'll be testing this field saying, are we running out of N with the amount of rainfall that we've had, almost record rainfall in April, a lot of rain in May, we'll keep up with it and making sure that as a grower, I'm not responsible for setting this yield back. Really easy for us to walk in here with a sprayer or a side dress bar wide drop and feed this crop for success. You know, when I look at this particular plant I'm holding my hand, I don't see this very often. We see some sand blasting and leaf stress due to high winds. A week ago in here, we had extremely two days of high wind of gusts up to 60 mile an hour, and there was some dirt taken off and blowing, and you can see a little bit of effect of this. My personal opinion is, I don't believe we've hurt the yields in here. Scouting at V7 corn is a really good time to see what our final ear counts are gonna be. So as we scout, we're looking at different size plants, late emergers. We start to nail down what our final ear count's gonna be so we can adjust for yield goal and then even determine the amount of nitrogen needed to obtain that yield goal. And then even to further complicate it, we do variable rate seeding. So we have populations from 39,000 to 36, 34, and 32. So in this case, we're in a 34,000 stand. We're gonna to need to move to a different soil type where we have 39 and refigure how many of these late emergers are really gonna put on an ear. 
you know, I always get a little nervous when I'm asked to come and work with a grower and evaluate his stand because you have to be real. And so when I walk in the field, there's just a checklist in my head of things that I'm looking for. And as I walk in here, I can quickly see this is a corn on corn field. So then you'd have to go back and say, what did last fall's combine look like? How was it set? How was it managed? What's the challenges that we presented to the spring pass? And then what kind of nutrient management was there? And then how many plants actually emerged? Did we understand saturated cold germs? And then did the planter itself create any negative effects and as it ran through and seeded this crop? So as I've stretched the tape here and looked, we got a pretty good stand, 31,000. But at the same time, reality comes and you can see we're missing 7,000 plants are not gonna put on an ear. The plants are more than two collars behind, half the diameter of the stalk, so as we look at that, we say, well, no, there's only going to be 24 that the, actually the combine is going to realize the effective yield. So at this stage, if we're ready to side dress in here, we need to have a realistic yield goal. How many dollars are we really going to write for a second application of nitrogen? As we talk about the stalks that I see here, realize there was a lot of residue that came out of that corn head that presented a challenge for the microbials to utilize. In other words, the stalks are long, and they're all completely intact, and it created a problem for quick breakdown. The tillage pass that was done in here left a lot of this residue on top, which is no problem if the row cleaners are adjusted correctly. I quickly pick up the row cleaners ran too deep. How would I see that? The hill valley. We planted this corn down in a valley. You can see the ridge of soil on each side of the plant. The heavy spring rains that we experienced in central Illinois created some of the emergence problems that we're witnessing here. So we say we have seven late emergers out of 31. That was due to the fact that water pooled down in this surface, created a crust, and then corn was late, and it was under stress. And even planting depth varies in here by as much as half an inch as we dig plant. So all those things come to the final outcome. At the same time, there'll be some good yields here. We just have to be real to ourselves. I always challenge myself every year, what can I do different the following year to get better? It's about being real for ourselves. You don't need to take an army with you. If you want to take your sweetheart, that's probably not a bad plan along. It's always good to have our wives see what's happening. But at the same time, you don't need to drag the whole neighborhood. In this corn on corn field today, we're in a scenario where these operators had a chance to pick this farm up for the first time this March. And it was a cornfield last year, and they had it standing stalks only. They decided to bring it back into corn, and so they chisel plowed in mid-March. And there was massive amount of residue incorporated in the top six inches. There was then a soil finish pass made, and the corn planter came in. As we stand here, we often talk about carbon penalty. As you look around me, you can see the discoloration where these plants are showing the symptom of sulfur, nitrogen, and micro deficiency due to the fact that the bacteria and the microbials to break down the residue stole the nitrogen that was applied here pre-plant with anhydrous ammonia. So even though we're seeing a yellowing and running short of end now, we know that this nitrogen will come back and there will be a lot of value, up to $100 of value of fertilizer in all this residue. But the challenge for this growing season is, these plants are under the gun. You know, you never want to walk in the field without your proper tools. I've often said, if you were going to rent my farm, the first thing I'd look in your pickup truck, make sure you have a tape and a spade. But in an interesting day, and I go to the back of my truck, somebody's removed my spade, and all I'm left with square patty shovel. So it'll work for today. And you know, this is a good time to be out checking. You can hear the neighbor here spraying behind me, He's spraying soybeans and you can hear the sprayer running behind, but let's take a look at this stand and analyze. What we're looking for at this moment is seeding depth. How accurate of a job did the planter do in positioning each seed for success? I'm gonna pop out these two late emergers and just take a look at the seeding depth, and then we'll pop out the guys that are larger next to them and see what they show. But in this case, as we dig into here, let's take a look and see what we can find. So we just take our tape, 
and we measure that length of that mesocotyl, and in this case, it's an inch and a half. So this seed was put in two and a quarter inches, and it's a pretty deep planting depth, and it got this seed late to emerge. Remember, the row cleaners here were dishing out. We can tell that by looking at the amount of soil, not just residue, but actual soil that was moved. Let's take a look at his neighbor here and see if he's about the same depth. Well, he's, he's shallower, but at the same time, we can see what? We can see residue put this plant behind. This residue is growing right through the root. This plant feels that effect, and it's going to slow it down and put it under stress. So when we see that much residue, as we pop it out actually growing in the root system, there's always a pathological effect to that. We'll go here next door, right to the plants beside that were much larger in, in height, and see what, they, what size they are. We'll pop him up, knock the dirt off of him. Take a look at his mesocotyl. I like the way it looks. It's exactly at one inch. So this plant was planted at an inch and three quarter. We always add to three quarter. Compared to this guy here, that was planted at two and a quarter. And a half inch at this stage of planting depth in April can make quite a difference. Other things that I'm looking for besides just the length of mesocotyl, which in this case was an inch from the crown to the seed for an inch and three quarter planting, I always like to hold these plants up after we knock the dirt off of them and see if we see any roots pointing directly at us. The minute they do, if they're pointing, instead of growing down a 30 to 35 degree angle, if they're pointing at us, then we're the problem. In other words, we've created some kind of a tillage layer in here that makes these roots turn. In this case, as I look at this plant, I like what I see. Um, I don't see any type of a tillage layer. This soil was worked deep this spring and then come in of a finished pass for right ahead of planting. And so this plant got a pretty decent root system. We're going underneath it. So as I dig these kind of roots and corn on corn, you're always concerned about rootworm feeding. And are we in any type of a scenario where you would see it on the roots themselves? So as we look here, what I'm looking for is the tip of the root, would it be fed off? In other words, as it's fed off, and here would be a classic. So as you look at this, the larva come up and fed on this number three crown root. And when it feeds and kills the tip, the root then does what we call dog, like a dog vein. It just, it just veins out in many, many different layers. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It split off. It killed the end. It's got seven different layers trying to go through. Now we're pushing a rope through the ground. Basically what we're saying here is this number three crown root's gone about as deep as it's going to go. The micro roots will have to take over now, but they'll never pull the same amount of water. So this right here is due to rootworm feeding. Corn on corn is something we're always concerned about. This larva come in and bit on it, killed it, and now we're having to force through the ground, almost looks like you're trying to push an umbrella that's open through the soil. So this looks more like a tile probe going down through the profile. Got a lot of capability. That root tip just continues to grow and multiply and just continue to force its way down. This is going to be pushing that umbrella through the soil and you're just going to struggle to get any kind of depth out of it. A little later in the season here, we'll do some root floats and we'll be able to say exactly how many larvae do we have? Did our GMO package or did our insecticide do what we said? When we're out scouting, whether it's a corn field or a bean field, we're always evaluating how our harvest pass went the previous fall. And in this case, as we see volunteer corn right beside this corn row, we start to look closely and we say, where did this corn loss come from? Was it up in the header? Or was it out the back and it come over the top of the sieves and went through the straw spreader? In this case, it came off the head. We can see all these individual kernels that were lost went ahead and sprouted. And this here is exactly what 360's yield saver chains are all about. Can we close off that added opening of the deck plates and eliminate and put all these guys in the grain tank to sell to town versus where we come in and we see now that they're in here and they're gonna create and draw nitrogen 
and they're going to withdraw nitrogen and sunlight out of this corn crop. So it's always good for you and I to say, what are the areas that we can improve in everything that we're doing in the previous season? So today we're here in our 76 day corn that we're using here at the proving grounds for our early harvest. So in about another 10 days, we'll go ahead and salt this corn down with Defold 5, and then we'll let it go and hopefully be harvesting here on August 1st. But today as we're pollinating, we're taking a look at how we're coming. So on the outer part of the field in the end rows, the ears are much more advanced. And so usually when we talk about pollination, I'll just take my knife and we'll split this here so we can get these shucks right off. And of course, you can always tell what's pollinated because when we get it taken off, we can then take and look at the actual silks and see which ones are attached. So let me get a cut down here and we'll unwrap them very carefully. And we'll just go ahead and shake it. And so you can see that there's one or two here that didn't pollinate that are still attached. But here on the tip, there's a few to go yet. And I would say we got about eight long that are still attached as we shake it and we can pull it off you can see here those that are still attached so we're down here about eight kernels every kernel's worth six bushel so we got 48 bushel yet that's at risk and it'll it'll pollinate here we got a cloudy day got some rain coming in here later this afternoon we shouldn't have any trouble getting this pollinated if for example there was a long extended pollination by that I mean at least four days from the butt of the ear to the tip. Later in the season, they will turn a different color. So this will be darker yellow, and then the last eight here will be white. If you see a color difference, white on the tip to yellow, you realize you are not gonna get these. And so those last eight, if there's a big color differentiation here in a week from now, we'll realize they pollinated too much uh, behind, and we're gonna lose those. Let's go ahead and grab some of those that are here in the field. And as I look here in the field, you can see we got a lot of Japanese beetles that come in and they're feeding here in the silk. So there's always a chance that it could somewhat herd pollination. I don't see enough population of them that I would consider it to be an issue yet. At the same time, these are definitely not our friend. And so we'll go ahead and cut this one open and we'll see, and it's gonna be further behind so there's going to be quite a bit yet to go in here. And so I'm excited about getting some, some rain this afternoon and some good weather. And we'll get this field, this early field, we'll get it pollinated. We'll go ahead and carefully peel back the, the outer layer here. So in this case, we probably have almost 40% more of the kernels yet to go. At the same time, we've got quite a few here on, on the bottom side of the ear, They're the butt that are pollinated. You can still see the silks that are attached. And then I'm gonna guess, let me just quickly count, about 20 yet to go on length, yet to go here. So on the inside of the field, they're a little bit behind what they were in the outer rows. All in all though, as I look here, I think we'll pollinate fine. I don't see enough insect pressure to make me pull the trigger insecticide. So even though we're in some really early corn, this is corn on corn. So at this stage, we're looking for disease. And we know that gray leaf comes from the bottom up out of last year's residue. And of course, rust is coming in on these southern wings from Texas, blowing in and that rust will be coming from the top down. The leaf that we're always concerned about is the ear leaf itself. This is your golden ticket. This is your big money leaf. So in this case, this is mounted right up below the ear shank here. And so as I go in a field, I always pull these two leaves, the one below the ear, so I understand what disease is coming up. And as we look at it, and you can see we're starting to get some gray leaf in here. You can start to see it starting to light up. And then we look at the leaf itself, that it's the ear leaf, and we say, how much would we have on here? And so pretty clean overall. What I'm looking for, as I look at the lesions coming up the plant, if I stacked them all up, would they cover the size of the diameter of a quarter? And if they do, then we're gonna start to pull the trigger. So in this case, at the end of the week here, we'll be all brown silk, 
This is not a problem at all. We could come in here and put headline amp on and we could take care of any disease that we have. But in this case, as I watch this today, I don't believe that we're at a stage, as I look at these leaves, you know, I like to hold them up so we can use the sun to our advantage and we're looking for any type of gray leaf. It looks like a cigar, kind of a cigar burn or the ash of a cigar, cigar it would be sharp, you know, at the edge and blunt and off. In this case, this leaf passes the test. So as I look through this field, I would say at this time, pressure's not high enough that would justify or warrant a spray. As we also are checking pollination, this is a great time to take an early uh, ear development to see where yields would be. So for example, if we have 32,000 ears in here, this is a great time. I just usually take my jackknife and cut one out. And as I come around and I count, you can see this early corn, this 76 day corn set 14 around. The one I just had in my hand was 16. So they're 14 around. And so we know for every row around they're worth 10 bushel. Of course, as we've just mentioned, every kernel long is worth six. So we could go and we could count out and we could tell you, you know, get a pretty quick estimate. Um, markets are up a little bit today, but at the same time we're below where we would like to sell so we've been very attentive to the markets this, this summer. But in this case, we got 32,000 of these at 14 around. I'm gonna take a guess here that these are probably almost 40 long if we get a finished pollination. And so there you can quickly calculate where we think we would be on yield in this field. So besides checking pollination and the, and the timing of pollination, it's a great first look at what we can expect at harvest. So in this case, we have an ear here that's 16 around. And we count it up and we stop about an inch from the end where the pollen was still yet to go. We are 38 long. So at 32,000 that we have here, this corn's running in that 215 to 220 range. Of course, it's all gonna depend yet on the depth of kernel and there's a lot to go. If we run this field out of nitrogen and we start pulling back in the tip, we're gonna take that 215 down to 200 in a hurry. But at the same time, a great opportunity to start checking yield and see exactly where we're at. So this week in our corn county, there's sprayers and airplanes going all over the place. And you see a lot of action in the field on fungicides. And in our own operation, we're a big believer in it, especially in narrow row corn at the high populations we plant. It seems to always at least pay for the fungicide, but most times pretty good money in our pocket. So it's something we watch very closely. This field here, the corn I'm holding here, we just went ahead and sprayed this two days ago. And so we're looking for 14 days residual on this fungicide. And as you start at the bottom of this field, at corn on corn field, you can see quite a bit of lesions. Remember, we're going after the ear leaf and saying, can we protect it? As I look at this ear leaf, I can only find one very small lesion on it. But if we start adding up all the lesions we come up the plant on the lower leaves, we more than cover a quarter. And that's kind of my rule of thumb for my team I say if we could put the lesions and it covers more than a quarter, by the time we get to the leaf below the ear leaf, it's time to get the undercovers in there and get working. With me today in this cornfield is Mark Bear of Sun Ag. It's our ag retailer here, and he's our manager. And Mark and I have worked together for many, many years. And they've built their business on relationships and understanding what does it take to take growers to the next level. So we talked about this being a conventional hybrid, and for the plot purposes, we planted in a corn on corn field. And as we walked in here, we already saw some adult corn beetles. So we're just gonna take and dig around this plant, and we're just gonna dig around it about a three inches on each side of the stalk. So we're gonna get about a six inch in diameter root of soil. And I wanna get down about seven inches deep so that we can get this into the bucket and see exactly what we're gonna have. The buckets themselves are just full of two cups of salt. So we're out here doing some, some root floats, trying to determine what uh, the density or pressure of the adult corn rootworm larvae may be in this cornfield here. Uh, I've taken this bucket of water, added some salt to it uh, to help float the rootworms and working the dirt off of the the root systems here, trying to dislodge any uh, larvae that may be present. Um, our hope is to find none, but without due diligence, we don't know 
what our insect pressure is to be able to make the decisions necessary uh, to purchase the correct inputs, whether that be an insecticide or a trait for next year's crop that will be planted here. And so we're just going to work this dirt off looking for any uh, worms that may float. Uh, we Typically if we find eight or nine that would alarm us and that's at the point where we would make the decision and start comparing the costs of traits versus insecticides that would control these. Uh, obviously at this stage of the game we no longer have any rescue options if the pressure is too high for this crop. Um, it's too far along and the damage has already been done to the roots. As we look for, as we look through the roots we can also find where the, the root worm may have been and the damage that they've caused. Here we can find some what we call dog footing where the root worm has attacked the end of the root and caused it to fuster out. Uh, we'll see if we can keep working him around here and see if we can find the ornery guy that did it. The, these root floats here that, that we're currently working with, we would like to start doing this, say the first of June time frame or first, second week of June. Whenever you see the first firefly, if you're out with the family and the kids of an evening at a campfire or something and you start to see those fireflies buzzing around, then you know that uh, that's your trigger point to be out scouting for adult corn rootworm larvae. On this third root we have here in the float, this is exactly what we're concerned about. You see when they feed on that root, it spiders out. No longer can this root go as deep as it needs to. This is a number three crown root. It should be as deep as the corn is tall. So in this, where we're at right here, we got corn six feet. So this root should be six feet underground. And you can see he's only three inches because he can't push this heavy mat of spidered out roots. Damage like this is what we're taking a look at. At the same time, by not finding as many larvae in here, we're able to see that a lot of these roots are in pretty good shape. This is one, and I've only seen one other one on the whole root system that was fed on. So the brace roots are getting a good start in this crop, and this is the guy right here that shows the damage that's here. We'll take a look now on the corn here, and we'll show you some actual adults that are flying around, which would make me nervous to put conventional corn in here again next year. I see enough adults that I believe I would put a traded corn in here. When we're in the field scouting at this stage of ear development, we're always checking to see the height of the ear on the corn plant itself. That usually relates and tells us what kind of a growing season we had, good day or bad day. The more stress these plants put on, the lower the ear set. Remember, the corn plant can put an ear on any node. So if it was eight Leaf, leaf sets from the top tassel just means it had a little more stress. In this case, this variety that we're looking on set it on the on the sixth and the seventh. Rare that I can see ears set on the sixth. But the thing that I'm struggling with this hybrid is look how many doubles it's setting. Even though we're in here at 34,000 in corn on corn, this variety is trying to set doubles. The, well, the problem I have with that as a grower is this is going to become a problem. So it's not gonna produce grain on this one. Some of these in the field that I've been looking at have some grain on them, but these are gonna abort. And when this starts to dry off, this leaves an exact intravenous injection point for disease. So the minute we get into some August stress here, we're just about to August 1st, and when we start to get stress, this is gonna die out, and then disease is gonna happen on it, and it's gonna put disease right in here in the shank. Remember, the big ear is on top of that. And what's going to happen is that ear is going to break off and we're going to have harvest loss due to the fact that we have so many doubles. So we'll look at this guy. This is the number one ear set on the sixth node from sixth leaf set from the top. Pretty nice ear in his own right. But these guys here are just going to cause nothing but problems as we go through the growing season. And you can see here it pollinated but it's not gonna produce any kernels. A lot of times we're in scouting, the best friend we can take in is a tape measure and a spade. And when we see these late emergers, it's always good to pop them out and say exactly what happened here and how, 
how did this become so late? In this case, we're in an, a chopping stalk roll that creates lots of residue. So we're gonna dig him up and see exactly in that root ball what the culprit would be that he would be so late. And we get down to the seedling root itself and I can see exactly where the evidence of the old seed coating was. In this case, you can pick up the red coating here that was on it. You can also pick up, there's lots of residue that's right in this trench, right with it. Take a look at this piece of residue that was running across here. See how it was coming through? And it's coming right through the other side. Let's see if we can knock a little more out. As I'm knocking it out, you can see all the different pieces of residue that I'm knocking out with it. And so these small fine residues that are here in the dirt are the ones that are creating this kind of a disease. And when he's so late, he's just gonna become a nubbin or basically a weed. Most times it's also good if you can take and you can split a plant. Let's go ahead and split this one, take a look inside of him. And see what we can put, see. So we know that this plant, as it's growing, it fills all these nodes up of nutrients. And it's the warehouse shelf. And so it loads all the, the racking with nutrients. And as this plant starts to fill this ear, as it starts to fill this ear, it starts to withdraw these nutrients down. As it comes down, you get to the bottom. At this time of year, we start looking in here and we're saying, are we still clean? What I mean by clean. As it removes the nutrients, it leaves in the cells what looks like styrofoam. That means the shelf is depleted. And so you and I are always wanting to keep one, two, three perfectly clean at this stage. Number four node here has just a small amount of cotton pithing, but at the same time, the fifth one here is depleted. By the time we get up here to number six, you can really start to pick up the styrofoam that's in there. This is your gauge of where your nitrogen level is. In a way, if you didn't have a soil scan, this is how I'd be looking at it. We want to always keep at least one of these nodes completely intact. If we get close to harvest and we deplete this whole plant and ravish it out, all the soil diseases and stalk rots will come rifling up in here and you and I will have a great time harvesting and investing in corn reels. And so, this plant, I would give this plant an A for the present time. Yes, we're depleted down here, but where we're at on ear development, I believe we're gonna make it and we're gonna keep at least one of these nodes full down here with a cork in it. As we talk about where we're at on the gas tank in this corn plant, a lot of times you'll see us come in and we get close to harvest and we do what we call the push test. We walk beside the row, we extend our arm all the way and we let go. And I just quickly do 10 plants in a row when I'm looking at different hybrids saying, where does the combine go next? If I'm sticking my arm all the way out with my shoulder right against the row, and I let go of that corn plant, and it's timber, in other words, it's falling to the ground, that's due to the fact that we hollowed out this stalk, and we have a lot of stalk diseases coming in. So a quick test of that, you just go in the field, you go right down the row, give 10 plants in a row the push test, and if they fall over, let's say four out of the 10 fall over, I'm gonna be on the phone telling the guys this will be the next field that we take out. I hate picking up down corn. So when I'm in the field at this stage, I'll just take my jackknife, cut the tip, the butt of that ear off, and then open it up carefully. So I'll just take and split the shuck, and we'll peel it off of the butt first, and then we'll carefully run that out, and we'll do the shake test. And I'm just shaking to see how many of these silks are actually still attached. We talk about you know, having a problem with, uh, with the Japanese beetle. And so if these silks are still attached, we know that we're gonna have some real issues. For example, we had some pollination issues down here at the butt, and you can see these silks, silks are still attached to the butt of the ear. No hope for this. This field has long had the pollen go by. At the same time, we did a pretty decent job 
of keeping all these guys here at the top pollinated. You'll see some white kernels in here that didn't make it. This guy here is going to be a blank. So in other words, same thing for right here. Silk was still attached to that one. And so we missed some due to the Japanese beetle feeding. But at the end of the day, kind of like what I see here, except for the butt itself. So all in all, I think we'll make pretty good grain here. But it's something that you and I need to be checking. Silks grow a half an inch a day. If I'd have walked in this field and saw a pollination of four inch silk, you realize we're behind in pollen shed, maybe 95 degrees or some real cloudy rainy weather, and the pollen's not flying down, and that four inch silk is your clue that pollination's taking way too long. Picture perfect, 48 hours, I'd love to have these ears pollinated. I realize we live in the real world, and sometimes we're glad if we can get it done in a week.